Marlene Decker, I'm the director of the African Studies Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to um, this annual lecture, both here in Leiden, but also online um, in the live stream. Stephen Ellis was a renowned senior researcher at the African Studies Center Leiden. He was a courageous and deeply inquisitive researcher. Um, going further than most researchers of his generation to uncover the hidden truth about Africa. And Stephen combined a great interest in how real politics work and have an impact on people's lives. And he did so as an historian with particular attention for the way history influences the present. With the Stephen Ellis Annual Lecture, the African Study Center honors Stephen as the great scholar that he was and encourages others to work in this spirit as well. And today's lecture is special for two reasons. First, of course, is we are delighted to welcome Dr. Mercy from Nigeria, who will introduce us to the National Archives of Nigeria who are uh, housed in Ibadan and share her reflections on the uses, the usage and use of national archives um, or archives for modern African studies. And importantly, Stephen made extensive use of those national archives. And in fact, they were the last archives that he worked in before his passing. Secondly, tonight we also present Stephen or the Stephen Ellis Archives. And as a center, we are very proud to be able to provide home to Stephen's archive, an incredibly rich archive that we hope will also encourage others to work in his spirit. Organizing and unlocking the archive has been an enormous exercise um, with careful and systematic review of the various contents. This would not have been possible without the extraordinary energy of Tichon van der Hoog, who is there all the way at the back, <laughs> who deserves a special mention here. Thank you very much, Tichon. And thank you, Harry, for trusting the center with Stephen Archive as well. Without further ado, mm -hmm. I give the floor to Dr. Agenika Akinoada, who is the chair of the Africa Study Center Researchers Assembly, who will further introduce tonight's program and speakers. Akinika. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome once again to the Stephen Ellis and our lecture this 2023, Russian the ninth event. Uh, over the years, we had some uh, in 2015. Howard French was here. 2016, Monandulo, Amido Kavanagh, 
Henrietta Moore, who asked a simple question, what is prosperity for Africa? 2019, Emmanuel Achempong came all the way from the States, talking about spirituality, culture, and political power. Jonathan D. Janssen, decolonizing the mind, which will have made even uh, Bob Marley very happy. Lovely presentation. Nanjala Yambola, African Feminist in Method, 2021. And last year, given the context of COVID, we also invited Professor Megan Vaughan, Africa in Time of Coronavirus, Biology, History, and Politics. The name is strange when you look at it, Megan, when you look at what is written by the same bond. In Nigeria, we say Vogan. Because it's a difficult name to pronounce. Interestingly, we now have a Nigerian this year. Now you look at the name Messi, Ruaganati. You start wondering, okay, which name is easier to pronounce? But Messi, thanks for coming. Uh, we'll be presenting to us today the place of archives in modern African studies. And basically, this comes from the background that uh, our director, Marlene, mentioned that the University of Ibadan at the archives was where Stephen worked. Uh, his last um, visit was there. So we do that today in honor of his work over there using archives. And using archives, and using archival collections for critical and reliable research on Africa is largely determined by the state of access to and representation of the archives, as well as the researcher's disposition. And Stephen's disposition was this. Archives are sources of power and contestation and will be subjected to objectivity test. So today, again, without further ado, I therefore invite Dr. Matthew Iraganati to come and present to us the case of archives in modern African studies. You will be with us for like 25 minutes to say things that we uh, would like to hear from you. After which, uh, Prof. Um, Kimuke Uche will also come on board to also give us from his disciplinary perspective, from his work, what he has done so far, how archives have been useful and uh, delicate. And in the last sense, Jos Damen, of course, will present on the presentation of the Archives to us. <clears throat> um, now, second. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thanks tonight, tonight's presentation by establishing this protocol. And so I'd like to recognize the president of Ladies University he is called um, Rector Magnificus. <laughs> I also recognize the Director African Studies Center, Leading. I want to recognize the Chairman, African Studies Center, Leading Researchers Assembly. I will not conclude this recognition without recognizing the Stephen Ellis widow, Professor Gerrit Hart. I hope I have pronounced this well. Faculty and staff of the African Study Center. Participants online, I recognize you wherever you are watching. <coughs> Students of um, African Study Center, 
lady, ladies and gentlemen. I bring you warm greetings from Nigeria, from the University of Ibadan, and from the University of Ibadan Library, known as the Kenneth DK Library. Talking about archives, actually, Kenneth DK was in the forefront at establishing an archive in Nigeria. And so the library, the, the um, archive that you know started in the library, he, he initiated it before it was moved. I am honored and delighted to be here today to deliver the 20, 2023 edition of the Stephen Ellis Annual Lecture titled The Place of Archives in Modern African Studies, a such light on the patronage of National Archives of Nigeria Ibadan. It is said my name is Dr. Messi Iradanachi. I won't, I won't take time to run through this. I would um, give an introduction. I would look at um, <coughs> modern African, stud uh, African studies, old and the present African studies. Then we'll look at imperatives of um, archives to modern African studies. We'll look at the dangers, and then we'll go down to the archive proper in uh, Ibadan, looking at the challenges, the automation efforts, and then we look at um, the we look at the this. Are you sure you opened the one I want to present? <laughs> yeah. um, this, uh, this does not really reflect some of the things I changed. Can I use my stand? I put my stand here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you do with my The introduction. Is this the PowerPoint, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's supposed to be new, but I removed some of the corrections are not here, so I'm not sure if this is the easier to turn my own instructions. Okay, so, um, So let me start by saying that we cannot talk about archives without looking briefly at what archives actually are. And um, no Yes. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> he gave me the wrong one, but it's okay, we found what I actually wants. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So by way of introduction, I have a quote, and um, it is by Sarah Sheridan. She said, research materials can turn up anywhere in a dusty old letter in an archive, a journal, or some old photographs you find in a charity shop. The study of Africans, their past depend largely on archives because one of the best ways of studying a people is by searching for their roots. And so tonight, archives are treasure troves of historical records and information, as well as hubs <coughs> of national, state, individual legacies globally. They are repositories of records. They are significant aspect of academia and the building blocks for which researchers build analysis of how societies function, function and will function. They are catalysts for bringing the past to fall 
in order to prepare the archive of the future. Pre-colonial um, or the earlier studies of um, Africa focused on the study of African history, culture, and societies such as politics, language, religion, and economy. It was characterized by difficulty in actually assessing materials, okay, the materials that are required. That was because Africans didn't have, Africans didn't have that tradition of having their history documented at that time until the coming of the colonial, uh, colonial um, uh, masters. They were not, they were just embedded in oral traditions. And so the African book, according to Bassinia 1971, was in the heads of the people, basically preserved in the human minds. And they were passed from one generation to another through oral um, history. And so the research method that was employed at that time were basically oral history, historical ethnography, interpretation of um, cultural materials, cultural materials, and then paleography. So modern archive is actually an evolution of the old African studies, so to speak, becoming a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary field that focuses on almost all fields of academia. Okay, if we look at all of the lists, I'm not going to take our time looking at it because of the time, but it has it it it, it has a touch in every field of study, English, law, any field you can think of has the African coloration. And so it become it became a multidisciplinary and um, interdisciplinary. And so the research method that is um, that I employed now are the heterodox and omnivorous research methodologies, whatever applies depending on the interest <laughs> of study. You can then the study also must not be one method of um, research, it could be a combination. So it is outside of the norm where you have to use a, one or two research methods for a study. Africa, modern African study went beyond that. Research methodologies, and so the, the, the uh, listed out research uh, methodologies in modern African study, archival studies, historical analysis, field work where you have to do interviews, where you have to do focus group discussion, comparative analysis, policy analysis, content, survey, questionnaire, participants, observation, chairs, you just name it. The, the list continues. Okay. So the areas of interest of Africa for African studies. Uh, modern African studies they include colonialism and post-colonialism, African history, political politics and governance, development and economy, social and cultural studies, environmental studies, and African diaspora. Archives are important for um, archival records are important for modern African studies because they are significant aspects of academia and particularly modern African studies. They are the foundation on which researchers base their analysis of how Africa has been, how it functions, it is functioning and now it will function. They play a crucial role in advancing research and understanding in the field of modern African studies and so on. They help in preserving culture like indigenous languages, oral tradition and other um, cultural practices. Now, except the uh, uh, archival records are given the attention that is required because of their nature, the nature of archival materials are not like books that you just get into the library, you take a book and you begin to flip through pages. There may be just one, le one letter here, one photograph here, one map there, and so it, it, it involves a whole lot of rigor. And so if it, if, if it is not painstakingly done, then it will potent danger to the individual, it will potent danger to information that will be generated, it will potent danger to development. It will become, there will be omission of crucial facts leading to misinformation, which will hinder, hinder understanding of the past, 
it will distort the narrative, it will erode credibility of a historical account, leads to reinventing the wheels, it will perpetuate bias perspective and bring about negative impact on public perception and on the long run hamper the development that we all desire, that we want to achieve. So it is, it, it is necessary that archival re uh, records are critically used to achieve a desired result. Now let's look at how the archive, the National Archives in Ibadan is. I'll start that by just giving a brief account of the historical background. <laughs> and it was established in 1954 as um, the Nigeria Records Office to preserve and manage important records of Nigerian government that were of great value. And like I mentioned before, this was initiated and, um, um, and, uh, and uh, established by Kenetike, the, the, the then um, university librarian. He was the one who initiated this. And so that became the National Archives of Nigeria in 1957 at the University of Ibadan with his operation. Uh, then with his operation, operations moved to a permanent building in 1959. It is one of the six regional branches of the National Archives of Nigeria with the headquarters currently in Abuja. It is, it is, its mandate is to acquire, preserve, provide, and then provide access to the nation's record, historical, cultural, and administrative, of, uh, administrative significance needed for historical reconstruction of the nation. Its collection includes government documents, photographs, personal letters, map, audiovisual materials, and any other material considered as having historical uh, value. The current state of the archive is um, that um, the documents are materials sourced from government departments. They are of private, from private individuals. They are also from organizations. They are preserved, organized, and made accessible to researchers, scholars, and the general public for educational research purposes. Retrospectively, the archives primarily focus on collections of government, official and colonial records documents, like administrative reports, legal documents, and correspondence from various government agencies. It has the representation policy of provenance and original order, description and annotation of documents based on the source of creation, and the order of creation in a chronological <laughs> sequence. No surrogates are created in the um, archives. The use of personal belongings and the prohibition level of the use of cameras and scanners are properly spelled out in the document, the policy document. Students are not allowed to bring in their pens, but pencils for writing in the reading rooms for security purposes. Users must obtain copyright permission to copy any original document from the archives. During the COVID-19, the archive embarked on an automation and digitization um, process. It didn't go too far because there were no facilities, there were no funds to actually carry it through. And so the, um, the, the digital uh, web application that they tried that, that, that was introduced that was used is called Atom Access to Memory. And so what they have that they tried to do is to provide detailed description of records using these basic entries, access records, archival description, authority records, archival institution or location. However, only few records were digitized. Only few have been digitized till date due to the lack of website infrastructure and skilled manpower. The few digitized archived materials are kept from public domain in adherence to the National Archives Act. Nevertheless, patronage of the National Archives Department remains high because of the value uh, of those materials, particularly due to the age of those resources. Now there are challenges, a whole number of uh, challenges facing the archives now. You know, that even um, requires urgent and serious attention. You know, the government has a misplaced priority, so to speak. That's my own opinion, and that's what I say. It, because if uh, there's a national archives and from, from um, um, literature, 
it is said that in the past 50 years, no new record has been purchased in that archive. So what we have are the old records with which that archive started, and then just a little maintenance of what is available there. And so there's a whole lot, there are a whole lot of problems, <clears throat> the poor uh, shortage of staff, environmental and facility degradation, insufficient budget, poor state of available preservation infrastructure. In fact, as we speak, the National Archives in Badong does not have a preservation unit, no conservation preservation unit in that archive. Furthermore, the materials are brittle, they emit unpleasant odor, non-conducive reading rooms with old and uncomfortable tables and chairs, unfriendly weather condition also is not um, doing any good to the library because the facilities that are required to keep that library up and doing are not available. That's why the deplorable state of archives in Nigeria, particularly and African continent, Africanist researchers continue to patronize them. And this brings to mind the question, what are then the fascinating factors to users of archives like Professor Stephen Ellis, who was an ardent scholar of African studies. A brief look at what the archives look like. They do not encourage um, historical research, considering the rigor involved in searching these materials. Then several studies have decried the state of the archives in Ibadan and in other African countries, and we have a whole lot of uh, people who have said so. The archives have documents of great value, yet brittle and smelly, non-conducive rigid environment, and fury referred to using such archives as dirty and strenuous work. Yet, Stephen Ellis, in honor of whom we are gathered tonight, patronized them. He used them extensively. It's been said, I won't, and I will not um, overemphasize this, because we all know who he was, a prominent Africanist researcher and historian who depended heavily on that particular archive that we are talking about today, the National Archive of Nigeria in Ibadan. Stephen Ellis used extensively, particularly for his last book, This Present Darkness, A History of Nigerian Organized Crime. He was known for his work and today, his work speaks extensively of the use of archives. And for him, archives are sources of power and contestation and must be subjected, and must be subjected to objectivity tests. A whole lot happened. I was reading about Stephen Ellis while I was preparing for this lecture. And I saw a whole lot that happened with his publications in South Africa, Liberia, and all of those places. And he scaled through because of that statement that archives are a source of power and contestation. His areas of interest, corruption and governance in African states, African politics, political systems, including issues of authoritarianism and democratization, <clears throat> political and economic factors contributing to corruption in Africa, human rights and justice system in Africa. Emphasizing his work emphasizes the importance of historical context in comprehending contemporary issues. He continued, the, the works continue to influence the field of African <laughs> studies even till date. It, they are aimed to understanding the root causes, dynamics, and consequences of conflicts in Africa. So, what exactly were the motivating factors considering the rigor, considering the smelly nature? Considering the, considering the state of archives, particularly the one in Nigeria. What were the motivating factors for Africanist researchers and scholars like Stephen Ellis? Access to primary sources. Archives are essential for historians to access primary sources, primary source materials to study and interpret the history of a region. Accuracy, and authenticity. They are primary sources. They are authentic, original documents that ensure the accuracy of reliability and historical research. Ellis had relied heavily 
on these materials to verify facts and events in South Africa, for example, the Mandela issue. So that he did. Then contextualization. Archives help historians to contextualize historical events by providing a wide range of documents that shed light on varied contexts of, um, uh, of um, issues. Commitment to scholarly rigor. Research is a hallmark of the academy. And Stephen Ellis understood this because it demonstrates a commitment to thorough research and evidence-based analysis, which was characterized by his works. <clears throat> Preservation of history, archives play a crucial role in preserving historical <laughs> records for future generations. Ellis often challenged established narrative and sought to provide alternative perspective. Using archives allowed him to explore lesser known or overlooked aspects of um, African history. To date, his records show that. Now, conclusion archival records are essential for Africanist researchers to do meaningful research. A consensus and meticulous attention and the use of archival records, like Stephen Ellis did, is required for creating history, mean critical history, that will enhance understanding, engender change, and bring about the desired development that we all seek. The current state of the National Archive of Nigeria, Ibadan, is appalling and has implications for research in modern African studies <laughs> due to neglect of uh, due to neglect and lack of funding by government and stakeholders. If urgent attention is not given to National Archives, if I don't, the use of secondary information that already are subject to bias will be encouraged over, encouraged over archival records that gives you credible information, credible records. And this will invariably affect the authenticity of research outcomes in historiography. What are the recommendations then if this is the situation? Government should give <clears throat> the needed attention to archives, particularly national archives and abandon. Professional bodies, funders, historical, uh, historical research, uh, funders of historical research, non-governmental organizations, private and public archives, and all end users should collaborate with government to rescue and preserve the National Archives in Ibadan. And I also say that archives everywhere. It should gone are the days where only government is left to do everything. I think we all are stakeholders. We need to come into um, the play and contribute our uh, quota. Africanist <laughs> researchers and historians must return to the rudiment of producing critical history for academia and the nation at large, and the world even at large. That is why we are gathered today. If Stephen Ellis didn't do what he did with archival records, I'm not sure we'll be gathered here today. We would have been, he would have been forgotten like every other Africanist researcher. But no, he did critical studies and has a lot that we look uh, to and say, yes, these are good. Um, critical histories that have been created. Private collectors should encourage, should, uh, be encouraged to turn in their materials to the official archives where they can be assessed by scholars and other interested persons. Continuous sensitization to the indispensability of archival materials to research and social reengineering is of utmost necessity. The choice of this year's Stephen Ellis annual lecture is not only laudable, but explicit advocacy for the revitalization of archives. There is therefore a clarion call, a clarion invitation to multinational cooperation, philanthropists, friends of the archives, Africans in diaspora, and highly spirited individuals to consider promotion of endowment initiatives for a robust and sustainable national archives. 
it will be a great pleasure to me that after this presentation, we are not just leaving it at the talking level, but that we, you know, escalate to the action part where people, good spirited people, lovers of archives, lovers of knowledge, come to endow something. I have said in the National Archives in Ibadan, there is no preservation unit. What will an archive look like without the preservation section? We leave the materials to decay, and in the near future, we have nothing to consult. So, good spirited people should come to endow something. It will be pleasing to me, and it will leave a legendary legacy of Stephen Ellis if the unit, the preservation unit, is revamped and is named after Stephen Ellis. And they say this is Stephen Ellis preservation section of the National Archives of Ibadan. Stephen Ellis, wherever he is, will smile and be happy. <laughs> but are we ready? It is not just good enough to talk and talk and discuss these issues. <clears throat> this lecture of today calls all of us to endow something. Five million Naira every year would do a whole lot to that archive. And whatever is being done leaves that legacy that Stephen Ellis would have loved to have. And so I am calling and I'm encouraging and I am challenging us all, including myself. Can we move? Stephen Ellis is a lover of the archives, a lover of knowledge, a friend of archives. He used archives so much intensively, so much so that we are gathered today to celebrate him, to, to, to honor his memory with a lecture on that archive. I call on everyone, let's do something to perpetuate a legendary legacy for Stephen Ellis. I thank you for having me. I thank you for listening, but I won't leave until I thank some few persons. I want to really appreciate my Nigerian brothers who reached out to me to be here to make this presentation. Dr. Emmanuel um, Adeniji, he got through to me and then handed me over to, to Dr. Uh, Olaika. I want to appreciate you for believing that from um, the University of Ibadan, we have what to present to this audience. I want to thank the Stephen Ellis widow for accepting and approving for this. I sincerely appreciate you, ma'am, and then um, I know that in honor of Stephen Ellis, a great more will be done. And I believe that you are up to it. And others who will join you will do things to leave that legacy that you would have loved to have in Africa, and particularly in Nigeria. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you very much. Um, if you know, then we will ask some questions later, another comments. Okay. I would like to use this opportunity to invite uh, uh, Prof. Chibuke Uche to give us uh, from, his, um, from his work, <laughs> what's after the release of archive uh, name. Thank you, Prof. Uche. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, let me start like a Nigerian. Let me say all protocols observed. Okay, so, uh, 
We do essentially by our share some of my reflect of 30 years of being a cover. 30 years ago, I enrolled as a PhD student in accounting and finance at the London School of Economics. And four years later, I defended my thesis title, Banking Development in Free Independent Nigeria, a study in regulation, control, and policy. That thesis went ahead to win the International Economic Certification Prize for Best of Morality of the day between 97 and 2000. At the ceremony we went to in Argentina, uh, the Economic History Faculty at LSE had about 20 delegates. The accounting and finance were the only person. So they were wondering how this interloper from accounting and finance will come and win such prize in economic history. The strategy was simple. I had also friends in economic history. The leading professor in economic history at the time, uh, the leading uh, the Africanist in economic history was Gareth Austin, who is now retired in. Chair in economic history at Cambridge. And once I was in LSE, I made sure he became my mentor and I was very close and still in that. So that was one strategy. Secondly, for my thesis, I used about six different archives. So clearly, I got used to <coughs> how to use uh, essentially archives. And essentially, I used the Bank of England archives, I used National Archives in the queue, I used uh, World Bank archives, I used the Bank of Archives of the Bank of International Settlements, and I used the Factory Bank archives in Woodinshaw, and I think I also used uh, the archives of Standard Chartered Bank in London Metropolitan Library. So I used this, essentially, I used all these archives. So I have some idea of what the archives look like, and I've also built on this next one. So the, the key today, uh, how did I end up in archives? So my background is in finance. My first degree in Nigeria was in finance. My master's from the University of Dickens was also in finance. How did I move to archives? Well, uh, I was always fascinated by numbers. And I liked and I believed from an early age, partly because of the influence of my late brother. He was an accountant. So I liked the way he used numbers to explain everything. So I decided to train as an accountant. And essentially, so I went to, uh, after my degree in the University of Lagos, I went to uh, Coopers and Library, which is now private house Coopers, was one of the big four accounting firms I had. That was, that was where the problem started. We were, because as one of the people, we were required to put, to apply international accounting standards to a local environment where they, were, they did not fit. So it was a total mistake. So for the first time, I began to see accounting information, the cost of providing accounting information actually being more than the benefits it derived from the accounting information because the struggle was to fit two, two different things that never fit. They did not fit. The dynamics in Africa was different from what was in the UK and America where the traditional standards came from. So I started querying myself. Then there was this cliche in Nigeria, oh, the world is one global village. I asked my partners, they told it's one global village. I didn't see, I didn't understand it. But after I qualified, I decided, let me go and investigate this problem because I now started believing that accounting was a problem about that. The country was actually leading from the development plan because it did not match. So there was no better place to go uh, than uh, the London School of Economics. So I went to LSE, then uh, Christopher Hopwood had just been appointed to the Center Young Chair in International Accounting and Financial Management. And they were leading this accounting organization and society kind of research. So this was where to be. So after I did a master's degree and then I discussed it during my master's with uh, Christopher Napier, uh, my concerns, and he also trained as an accountant. So he understood the issue and he agreed to supervise me. And we agreed to look at accounting regulation in the banking industry. We wanted to deal with the high level of uh, accounting regulation so that the numbers uh, will be guaranteed. And that's what it's so we chose the banking industry, which has all my highest regulatory standards in Nigeria. And so we agreed to look at that. But early in my PhD, I went to the Bank of England Archives and I, looked and I saw what I thought was, I realized that the banking itself, the development of banking, the, the, the focus on the development of banking that we knew then, there was a lot in the archives actually we write and we interpret it. So, the, so then our, my PhD now shifted to uh, the politics of banking development in Africa. So that's how my PhD shifted. But of course, later I did some things in uh, in the accounting, like the work I did for and, uh, the accounting profession in West Africa, and the work I did on development of the accounting profession in Nigeria, uh, and 
in the work I also did upon resolution for accounting with Chris Polyos in the University of Sydney. So I contributed to that, that to the account of what brought me to the LSE, but I, like I was derailed totally. Okay, so I came to uh, I came to the archives now. <coughs> so essentially, I've learned today. I will share with you six things I've learned from the archives during a professional lesson from the thirty years of doing archival research. And uh, the first one I learned is I think timing is important, luck is important, and strategy is important. These are three things that I'm important. And I can briefly explain this. If I had arrived at the LSE. 10 years earlier, I wouldn't have written the kind of thesis anyway, because the material from have been released from the archives is to the past 30 year period. Luck is, in, and if I had arrived five, 10 years later, I'm sure the field would have been scavenged in five years by these economic historians who were much more strategic than me. Luck is also important. And with luck, I'm, in 2001, I was. Uh, I was, I've had concurrent dissertation to economic history department in LSE and SUAS as a liberty specific body. And I made a presentation on banking developments and on credits in West Africa. And after my presentation, a lady walked up to me. She introduced herself as Jane Dyer, who was then, I think, professor of the anthropology of money at Northwest. And she told me, Look, I have one message for you. The National Archives in Kiev have just released their papers on the Nigerian Civil War. There's a lot of things on money. I should go and look at it. Okay, like, so, and I did that, and that, and that led to my people on money matters in a way, and with a different experience. But in that archives, I now realize there was an, an even bigger issue that the whole story of the Nigerian civil war was actually the real story was totally different from the actual. But what was happening really was that up until then, the, all the rule all you played was not in the Nigerian civil war picture. And in the archive, the oil history was shown. So I interpreted the history of the Nigerian civil war in the context of the new information on oil. And that led to my paper on oil and Nigerian civil war, which essentially changed the narrative on the civil war. Okay, and that was the real benefit of that was the lock element. The third part, of course, was a strategy too. And, and I hate to say this because if you were you work in a colonial archive, you become a colonialist. And I and I, this is a part of my history. I'm not part of it. I found myself becoming a colonial. I could be colonized banking in Ghana as I said, I don't. <laughs> okay, so uh, this was one area I was not proud of. So that is the first one. Uh, uh, the uh, the second one. Okay. Uh, the, the second uh, lesson, of course, is that the real reasons that in archives, the real reasons are always sometimes different from the official reasons. And this is clear. I mean, if you look at the example I gave in the Nigerian Civil War, but it also do like the works we did in Tanzania, for instance, the nationalization of law in Tanzania in the 78, <coughs> no reason said to myself. The official reason was clear. They said, oh, the official reason because no <coughs> and tiny role and who broke the regulation with respect to uh with respect to the sanctions against South Africa. But the real reason had to do with Yerere's anger that no, that tiny ruler of so was supporting was against Mugabe in what is now uh, Zimbabwe and was supporting his opponents. And that came up again from the archive. So that history again was also reinterpreted. Because if, in my view, that this is one of the key things in archive, because if you don't have enough information to reinterpret existing knowledge, then essentially what we have is you become an antiquarian, not a uh, a, a historian from a scientific perspective. <laughs> so, uh, so another issue has to do with uh, the second lesson I learned, be careful with professional reports. Because from the archives, it's clear that the colonial governments used professional reports in unprofessional ways, and they used it to promote their interests. And so you be careful how you take it. Like clearly, there are several examples of that. If you look, for instance, if you look in, in the context of Nigeria, for instance, if you look at uh, in the context of Nigeria, for instance, if you look at the uh, Fisher report in 1952, for instance, uh, on banking, essentially when the African wanted the central bank uh, to protect some of their failing indigenous banks, and the government said, oh, we'll bring an expert from the Bank of England to come and look at it. One of the things they said, oh, they brought uh, J.L. Fisher, who was a senior economist in Bank of England, and he came, of course, and stamped on the idea. 
Nigeria wasn't ready for Central Bank, right? But fast forward 30 years later, new caravan material came out. And what, what was there? We found documents in the archive that showed that when they invited Fisher to do the job, Fisher said, no, he didn't. The archive the email was something like this uh, from the executive director. I have sounded out the uh, Fisher for the Nigerian assignment. He thinks it's thankless and will not like to do it. He will, however, take it on the condition that we tell him the conclusions we wish he does. And that was so Fisher said telling them London with this report. He came and wrote it. The same, if you look at such a credible report, 51 in Ghana, that was exactly also what similarly happened. So essentially, be careful with what you, uh, when you read professional reports, you should interpret it in different contexts. That was it. Then the next one is the archives also learn from past history. And, and that's that's an important one. So one thing uh, we, we realize is that archives have a way of learning from past mistakes. So what you see today may not be there tomorrow. We, well, for instance, know from the archives in Belgium that uh, Patrick Lumumba, the, the Belgian government had a hand in this killing. Okay, and the CIA signed off on it. In Nigeria, for instance, we had a, the first army chief, Agui Rossi, uh, was uh, later became head of state after the 1966 war. And we know that from the archives that the British government they never liked him. And so well, I once tried to trace whether the British government signed off on his film in his And I traced and traced and traced it. Finally, I got to a place where, of course, they didn't like him when he came to power. They didn't like him when he put his unification decree, which I thought was still in. Uh, the, the anger, they said, no, this is, we can't take this. But then when it comes, we traced it to the final document where there were two weeks before he was killed, there was this top secret document. And when we got to the place looking for the document, what we saw was the notes. This report has been removed and destroyed by T. R. Green, prime, private secretary to the prime minister. This was one month before it was to be made public. I don't know what was in that report, but who knows, we may never know. So uh, let us be careful. Then the... the and the next one. One thing I found useful, I like to okay, about, about triangulation. The way people we use tri triangle, we see triangulation. Triangulation is so important. And I give you an example. One of the stop recites we did on a cry uh, on, on a conflict between the British Petroleum and the Nigerian government, capital gains tax rate. The summary was simple. Nigerian government changed the capital gains tax law. British government, the British petroleum did not do it. They did one tran transaction in the UK, and the Nigerian government came after them and said that that required them the, to pay one tax million as capital gains tax. That at the time was 200% of British national, British national revenue in Nigeria. So all the all the political uh, instances were triggered, all the assets, arsenals were brought out. Uh, the British, British petroleum were accused. The head of FIRS, Federal Internal Revenue Service in Nigeria, asking for a 10 million bribe so that he can reduce the assessment from 130 million to 20 million. And they, they said they wouldn't pay that kind of money. But also, the archives also showed that British Petroleum hired two Nigerian brothers, like Kintola and Lucy Williams, who were well known in Lagos, well connected, and they used all manner of tactics through the Appeals Commission, through uh, the uh, Public Service Commission, uh, to try and bring down the good there. Of course, these things are never discussed and can never even briefly couldn't have put it in the archives. But how they came into the archives was because every time they had a meeting, the brothers always went and briefed the British High Commission. And once they left, they put it in the memo. And those memo ended in the National Archives. Mm -hmm. And based on that, we were able to read a pretty story. So I think triangulation is something that is also uh, important in what we do. I'm not yeah, and this another finally the last lesson I've come in is well. Okay. The last lesson I have learned from the archives is that essentially use of local archives cannot be decreed. And I think it's something that I find worrying that is happening, in, especially in journals in the world. So when you write something and you bring new evidence from archives, well, we started this business. It's something like this. You could bring once you bring new evidence and Reinterpret existing scenario. But nowadays, you bring new evidence and you want to reinterpret. And we've had this problem in our research in Tanzania, uh, nationalization in Tanzania, Uganda. They want to oh, must go to Uganda and, go and bring their own archives. And essentially, I find myself doing the work of an antiquarian because what I see that I go to like 
our guest speaker has described, it's so difficult, especially in issues that relate to the Western Africa, where essentially the African position can actually be known in the exchanges that are well found in Western archives. But if you go to archive Nigeria, like getting it is so difficult. So you find you find a way and triangulate it and you do a carval and then in Tanzania and Uganda we've succeeded and we've gotten past the editors. But for two years now we have a project on uh Italian balances in West Africa and we can't get past the editors and they keep insisting you must get some African archives. So it's recently we hired uh a research assistant in the pattern, and he coordinated all the archives for us. I had people in Kaduna. Finally, he's now found something, some things related to the topic in Kaduna. But essentially, what is found in Kaduna are things that are so basic that we already have. But because they've been found in Kaduna, we now have to report that we also use the Kaduna archive and put those numbers. And hopefully, we'll get part, part the editors. So essentially, I think these are, for me, these are the uh, six most important lessons. Uh, I have learned from the archive. And in conclusion, generally, I uh, have two things, to, two things, two issues. And I think I'm happy that we have our librarian here who will. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm happy that we have our librarian here. <laughs> in terms of my conclusion, essentially, and I see African economies are shrinking. And what I see is that the Western focus on Africa and creating this archival data is decreasing. So, what the archives provide from the Western perspective is also shrinking. So the next generation of archival scholars who will want to depend on the West will not be as lucky as people like me. So that will not be, uh, because it's, it's all about all the numbers and money. Okay, But when these archives were created, Africa was, at the stage, Nigeria was seen as having better prospects than even India. So there was a lot of information, a lot of interest in those countries. So that is one thing, and I think, where I think our, I will give the conclusions to our guest speaker. Then uh, the second, I, I was also wondering, personally, with all these electronic data sets happening, and um, what actually will be the future of archives, African archives, for instance? I, I don't know. So maybe again, I will leave it to this. So I think at this stage, I think I would like to say uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one more uh, speaker, I would like to invite you, Damien, for the presentation of the Tivinelli's uh, archive. And there I'll tell you, I'll just a short break, then we can get you Welcome. Thank you very much. I would like to show you two books. This is an old book by Stephen Edelman. As you can see, it has been read and lend out many times. And um, it's his most famous book, I think. This is one of his newest books, translated in French, uh, still very new. And um, I'm going to tell you several things about the archives of Stephen Ellis. Um, first thing that I remember was the first day, the 3rd of July, 2018, when six meters of his archives were moved from a cellar box in uh, Amsterdam to a library in Leiden. You can see some of these meters uh, contained in these boxes over here. The second half of the Stephen Ellis archive was transported in the, the month coming after that. Um, Marlene Decker already mentioned it, but I would like to mention it too. Tifa van der Hoog organized, cleaned, and described the Stephen Ellis archives over the years, sometimes in a paid position, sometimes uh, in his own free time, along his regular work and his PhD work. So I'd like to very much thank him for that. The Stephen Ellis archive reflects the works and the thoughts of this famous and reliable historian who still is the most cited researcher of the African Study Center, even long after his boss. Um, and he's an enlightening example of a surprising and sometimes really uh, critical and fascinating research. The archives reflect not only the depth of his research, but also the versatility of his works. Versatile not only 
in geographical terms, because you can see publications of Stephen Ellis about Madagascar, but also about Togo, from Liberia to South Africa. The diversity is also shown in the enormous amount of chosen subjects. Stephen was interested not only in Dutch East India Company, the VOC, in Charles Taylor and his accomplice Martina Johnson, the court case of that is still running in Belgium. Uh, he also went to the Stasi archive to look for the uh, Communist Party card of Nelson Mandela and found it. Uh, he was interested in religion, in apartheid, in the 419 scam mafia in Nigeria. His dissertation was about the uprising in Madagascar in the 19th century. And there are a few dozen other subjects that I could mention. And I also like to talk uh, about the formats and the materials that we have in the Stephen Ellis archives. They are even more diverse in the 89 boxes and you can see them all over here. Um, you can find uh, letters, yes, paper letters, um, floppy disks, index cards, photographs, newspaper clippings, notes with informants, court case records, and a recipe for the making of methamphetamine. Yes, crystal meth, really. <laughs> you can find it on the third table over there. I will talk about that later. Um, which came up during uh, his research into uh, drugs in Africa uh, with notes about Isichuki and Dennis Orji. Um, so if we would go to the five tables that we have spread out here, five tables on cushions. Uh, you see on the first table, his dissertation, St. Anthony's in Oxford, 1980 on Madagascar. Some of his personal agendas from uh, over the years, a photo to hell with Taylor, some personal notes. Then on the second table, we find a very interesting, I saw somebody making a picture even of it, uh, a note of a meeting with Colonel Eugene de Kock in Pretoria Central Prison, born May 1996. Audio cassettes, floppy disk, several letters from researchers to and from uh, Stephen. In the table three, we see report on political prisoners in Togo, because Stephen Ellis was in the with with Amnesty International during the first part of his working life. This is the recipe that you don't need. And uh, uh, here is a, a handout of chapter three uh, of, a, of a book. Here is a book by someone else because the archives are archives. So you can not only find papers from Stephen Ellis, but also from other researchers that he worked uh, together with. Uh, there are two more tables over here that I would like to draw your attention to. There was recently some uh, press <coughs> upheaval about Prince Bernard of the Netherlands uh, being member of the... <laughs> well, Stephen Ellis already told us that. And has never... Uh, well, he, t he told us and he didn't tell us because this chapter one, The Prince and the Professor, is part of a book about the uh, World Wildlife Fund that he never published. Uh, it's a fascinating story. Uh, here are also some uh, oral presentations that he made in New York City for the American Historical Association. And this one is a copy from the Stasi archives. No, not the card. The, the the card from Nelson Mandela, but some other parts uh, from the Sud-Afrikanische General Hendrik van den Berg is the gefährlichste Feind Afrikaans, and some other interesting stuff. We find funny magazines, carpet action, and top secret. Uh, and at the last table, we see a copy from an archive in Madagascar. Nosewink from South Africa. Stephen Ellis was, as you all know, uh, for many years, the editor-in-chief of Africa Confidential. And uh, there are some 
up is in the archive. Uh, but also a book about 40 years of Africa Confidential. And here we find some, some uh, material on the Seychelles, mini state hijacked by Soviet agents, but also movement pour la résistance. Because Stephen know how to get his information from several sources. I still remember Stephen walking out of the room when a former president of a, um, an African country was speaking here in Leiden because he wasn't interested in the stuff that he already knew, but he was interested in new things. I could always see him talking to new young visiting fellows. Because he was interested in their stories. He was always curious to hear about the things that he didn't know and wanted to help us to understand uh, about the stories in Africa. So um, I would like to do one more thing. First, I would like to thank Pierke. Thank you very much for your help in the last weeks. Ursula, thank you for your never ending help. Harry, for making us uh, the proprietor of the archives of Stephen Ellis, in which so much material can be found for new researchers. And this can be found because of the uh, beautiful inventory that Tycho made. And I would like to thank him expressively for his tireless efforts for the Stephen Ellis archive. And I want to express that thing in, of course, a book <laughs> about another Leiden library. And I would first like to give the first copy of the archival inventory of the Stephen Ellis archive to Kerry It will be published next year on the website of the uh, ASC because it's a never ending story, of course. <laughs> and and we, we really like it. As you can see, it is really hard work. And it is a lot. And it has been described by Tico, and we'd like to thank you for that. By people, not only a copy of the inventory that you already know, of course, and a small present. Thank you.